This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. Vsh.org. I'd like to welcome you all to the monthly public lecture sponsored by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. The Vegetarian Society is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We are the largest local vegetarian society in the country now with more than 1,800 members. How many are members who are here tonight? Could you raise your hand? Well, it looks like almost a majority. Wonderful. And welcome to those who are not members. We'd like to encourage you to join the Vegetarian Society tonight if you're not already a member. I also encourage you to give a little of your time. We have a variety of interesting and important volunteer opportunities. If you're interested in learning more, please leave your name and telephone number at the literature table and a board member will call you back to discuss how your interests and your talents can mesh with the needs of our organization. You should know that although we have over 1,800 members, there are fewer than 12 who do the work of the organization and the vast majority of these have been doing it for 10 or so years. So we always welcome new talent and new friends. So please feel free if you have any interest at all in becoming more involved in either leaving your name at the back table or speaking with one of the board members here tonight. Two special guests, really. We have Kathy Gogel, who's founder and president of Animal Rights Hawaii. And she has a very special vegetarian guest, and she'd like to tell about that guest. If you could both, both come up. Our guest is from Slovenia. Her name is Teja Dronik. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of background why Teja is here. You may not be aware, but most of the pigs who are slaughtered on this island travel thousands of miles from factory farms in Saskatchewan in order to provide hot pork for a very small market here in Hawaii. Last summer, I had the pleasure of meeting Leslie Moffat from Animals Angels, which is an international organization based in Germany. They follow livestock transport trucks. They intervene. They provide water. They have intervened with the EU and with individual governments in trying to alleviate the horrors that animals who are subjected to thousands and thousands of miles of transport before the ultimate slaughter. I have the pleasure this evening to introduce to you Thea Dronic from Slovenia, who is an inspector with Animals Angels. She just has completed a month's inspection in Australia and has made the very long trip up here just to participate with us in a press conference on Tuesday in which we will be presenting the media with absolute proof of the cruelty of the livestock trade in pigs coming to Hawaii. She will be going all the way back to Sydney on Thursday and then from there to Frankfurt. So we really appreciate her long, long journey. And I'd like to introduce Thea Dronich. Hello. 
Thank you very much for such a warm welcome. I would like to say that uh, I work for Animal Angels now from seven years, but before that, my friends and I, we together founded a vegetarian union in Slovenia, in Slovenia, which is which was in 1994. So yeah, I was also working there for a few years. I just wanted to tell you in um, in really brief what our organization deals about animal transport because of the economic side of it. Uh, it's everywhere. And animals travel from Canada to Hawaii, from California to Mexico, from Belarus to Italy, from Australia to Middle East. And these journeys are really, really long. And animals, of course, because in in these journeys, animals are not referred as animals, but as livestock, which is a really, really not nice term, I think, because it gives them the, the sense that they are just there to be used. And because of that, they are not giving enough food, water, there is no ventilation, there is no space to move. And you can imagine that these journeys are really, really pure suffering for animals. And this is actually what our organization does. We go around and trail these journeys from the beginning to the end. We provide evidence to the government and we try to improve. And at the end, if this is possible, also to close live trade. So this is in short. Yeah, and the press conference on, uh, on Tuesday it will be about live trade, as Kathy say, of pigs from Canada to Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really inspiring to know that this work is going on. We're delighted to have Eric Marcus with us tonight. He is one of America's leading writers on animal agriculture. He's the publisher of vegan.com, a popular website devoted to animal protection and the vegan lifestyle. He also hosts Eric's Diner, a daily podcast talk show about food and farmed animals available from vegan.com. He's the author of an exceptional book published a few years ago called Vegan, The New Ethics of Eating. And he has a new book just released that has been receiving rave reviews entitled Meat Market, Animals, Ethics, and Money. This remarkable book is available for sale here tonight. And after the lecture, I'm sure the author would be happy to autograph a copy for you. Please welcome Eric Marcus. Hi. Wow, what a trip this has been. I've spoken in just about every big city in the mainland and have never made it out to speak in Hawaii. So this is my first time, and I've had such a wonderful time here. This is probably the most relaxed lecture I will ever give. Now, before I start, I would like to get a sense of who I'm speaking to and sort of how, I'm, how I can structure this talk. And to do that, I really need to know. I need you to raise your hand if you are vegan. Can you do that, please? Okay, about half the room. And keep them up and raise your hands if you are vegetarian. Okay, most of the room. Okay, now, given that at least half the room here is not vegan, I would like to devote the first half of my talk to talking about dairy products and eggs and why I think a fair-minded observer who knows about how these foods are produced will come to the conclusion that these foods are every bit as objectionable as meat products. Now, I guess I, I should start by giving you a bit of a background on how I got into things and how I ended up following a vegan diet. I was raised in a way that I was not allowed to leave the table during breakfast, lunch, or dinner without finishing my milk. And I ate meat three times a day all the way through high school and into my first year of college. I was never particularly a big animal person, and I am still not. So I want to tell you what brought me down the vegetarian path and, and how I eventually became vegan and share the insights I had with you. 
along the way. When I was 19, I went away to college and I chanced to walk into a dorm room and they had slaughterhouse footage playing on the VCR. I could not believe my eyes. Certainly I knew that meat came from animals who had been killed and I figured that they were killed in relatively quick and hopefully relatively painless ways. But what I saw on the video was just radically different from what I hoped existed. The degree of pain and fear that I saw on the part of these animals just knocked me over. It wasn't as though I thought my life should be devoid of all violence, and highly, highly principled or anything like that, but I felt as though, well, I have to draw the line somewhere. And given the amount of pain and fear that I clearly saw on these animals who were being bled to death, I felt like if I'm going to draw the line somewhere, it should really be at animal slaughter. So I decided that I needed to divorce myself from <coughs> slaughterhouses and do nothing in terms of my food purchases and my food consumption that supported slaughterhouses. So it seemed a relatively easy and straightforward way to go. I had no idea how to become was all the way back in 1986. It was a lot harder to go vegetarian then than it is now. The number of health food stores and the variety of vegetarian products was not as good. It was harder to find vegetarian cookbooks. But what I did was I just decided that I would get some vegetarian cookbooks and I would learn some new vegetarian ways of cooking. And what I found was that Really, the people who become vegetarian, the ones who are successful at it and have an easy time at it, what I noticed is that they don't focus their energies on cutting out specific foods. They don't worry that, oh, I shouldn't eat chicken anymore, I shouldn't eat hamburger anymore. What they focus on instead is finding new foods to replace those, the foods they grew up eating. And what happens is if you just make the effort to try a new food every day, the new vegetarian foods that you're eating start crowding out all the foods that you grew up eating. And every time you find one you like, it can sort of crowd out something that you were eating that had some meat in it. So when I made the switch, I started out by getting a vegetarian cookbook. I got the Moosewood cookbook, and it was full of recipes that contained dairy products and eggs, and then I got the Enchanted Broccoli Forest, and that too had lots of dairy products and eggs, and I really switched from being lots of meat to somebody who ate lots of dairy products and eggs, and I, I felt like that was progress, uh, because when you think about it, or at least when I thought about it, by moving towards dairy products and eggs, certainly there may be some animal exploitation related to those foods, but I figured that at least there doesn't have to be any killing related to those foods. It just seemed relatively common sense to me that this was a big improvement. It may not be perfect, but it was good enough. Well, then I started hearing this new word. And back in the 80s, you didn't hear this word very often. It's, a, it's called vegan or, or vegan. And it took me a while to find out that the correct pronunciation was, in fact, vegan. When I first heard about these vegans, I have to admit that I was perplexed and annoyed. By this time, I'd been vegetarian for about a year, and I really had made a graceful transition to an ovo-lacto-vegetarian diet, and I liked the foods that I was eating, and I felt like I did this without any great compromise, and I felt like this, doing this got the killing out of my food choices, and clearly that should be enough. And so as far as these, these vegans went, there's always got to be somebody who takes a perfectly good, working, fun concept and pushes it a little too far and takes all the joy out of it. And, and, and that's sort of how I regarded these vegans. So I was curious enough about why somebody would voluntarily do without dairy products and eggs that I figured I should look into things a bit and figure out why they are making this kind of change. And as I began looking into 
how dairy products are produced and egg products are produced, it became clear to me that, ethically speaking, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between dairy products and eggs. And in one respect, a big assumption I went on when I first became vegetarian could not have been more wrong. I thought that by becoming, by becoming vegetarian, I was divorcing myself from the slaughterhouse, that my food dollars were not paying to send animals to slaughter. And as it turns out, the dairy industry and the egg industry is thoroughly connected to the slaughter industry. In fact, every bit as much as the meat industry. Now, this is really counterintuitive, isn't it? Because if you have a hen who's producing eggs, if you kill the hen, it's going to stop. The eggs are going to stop. If you have a cow who's producing milk and you kill the cow, you're not going to get any more milk. So why should these industries be associated with slaughterhouses? It just didn't make any sense to me at first. In the years that have passed, I've really thought about, well, how, how can we explain this? And what's the best way to explain the ethical connections that, and why a vegan diet is, in fact, preferable to a vegetarian diet? And I think the best way to explain it is to really point out the fact that really the only difference ethically between meat and dairy products and eggs is that meat comes from an animal who obviously has been killed. Dairy products and eggs come from animals that will be killed, each and every one of them. Now, let me look quickly at why that's the case. And in both cases, actually, there's a common reason here. When you think about, well, what do dairy products and eggs have in common? Well, oddly and tellingly, they are both foods from young females. They are both reproductive foods. You don't get any of these foods from male animals. And why is that important? Well, it's important because females in, who are mature but still young are, uh, in, the ter in, in terms of hens, they're the ones who lay the most eggs. In terms of cows, they're the ones who produce the most milk. And as the hens get older and as the cows get older, the flow of milk, the supply of eggs, decreases month by month and week by week. And in fact, it doesn't take that long before the output of these animals has declined to the point that it works out to be financially advantageous to send these animals to the slaughterhouse and bring in new animals. And to give you a sense of that, it turns out that in the case of a hen, a, a layer hen, a 17-week-old hen, a hen who is just mature enough to start laying eggs, that, that animal can be purchased from a hatchery, ready to go. She will start laying eggs tomorrow for three bucks. So you can see that it doesn't take a whole lot of decline in egg production before you've reached the point that you're better off sending this bird to slaughter and bringing in a new $3 hen to take over. In actual practice, what this means is that really, in terms of the egg industry and the dairy industry, both of these industries, there is no such thing as middle-aged hens or middle-aged cows. In fact, quite to the contrary, it's very rare in the United States for a cow to be permitted to live even five years. They are almost always sent to slaughter before they are five years old. And a cow can live till about the age of 20. Chickens are typically sent to slaughter at about two years of age, even though they can live to more than five years of age. Now, these cows could still produce milk past the age of five, and significant milk. They could still produce significant eggs past the age of two. But in, in these cases, in, in just about every case, the producers of these products are better off financially getting rid of the animals, sending them to the slaughterhouse, and bringing in new, younger females who are capable of laying these eggs and producing this milk. Now, it's not just that these animals are all sent to slaughter. 
that I think is really objectionable. And in fact, after looking more and more closely at the issue, I've reached the conclusion that eggs actually are more suffering intensive than meat. And this sounds really counterintuitive, but if you were to have somebody come up to me with a hamburger and a hard boiled egg and force me to eat one or the other, you know, on ethical grounds, I would actually eat the hamburger. Now, let me explain why that's the case. I, I, I know many of you have heard of the cages that layer hens are kept in, but I need to describe them just a little bit to give you a sense of things because it is so shocking the degree of confinement that these hens experience in these battery cages. A, a battery cage is only about the size of a file cabinet drawer. And the egg industry typically stuffs between six and seven hens into a single battery cage. Now, to give you a sense of how much space they have, there's really a couple of things I could point to. Number one, that means that each hen has only uh, has less floor space than a sheet of typing paper. Uh, and that's how she spends her entire life, with that little space to walk about and roam. That's, that's her footprint of space in the cage. The other thing that is really disturbing when it comes to thinking about battery cages is that a battery cage, even if you were to only put one hen in a battery cage, that would still not be enough space for the hen to spread her wings. So what we're doing is we are cramming six and seven and sometimes eight hens into a space that small and expecting them to live out their entire lives. Now, a, a very disturbing thing happens along the way, and that is that, as you may know, hens are incredibly sociable animals. Most of us, I'm sure, have heard of pecking orders and the idea that hens actually establish levels of dominance within their group, and they can do this up to 30, 40, 50 different chickens if they're housed together. But past that, they can't remember each other, and that whole social hierarchy breaks down. Now, when, hens are, when, when chickens are kept under relatively good conditions, they are able to create pecking orders, and I've seen this happen in animal sanctuaries. What happens is one chicken will sort of challenge the other, and they'll get up on their hind legs, just like two boxers for a second or two, and one will sort of peck at the other, and it lasts only about two or three seconds usually, and then one hen or one chicken backs down and runs away, and that's the end of it. And so there's really no violence to speak of because it's over in a flash and there's no, the probability of any kind of wound occurring is really minimal. And that's how chickens establish dominance and social order within their groups. Now the trouble is that when you lock seven or eight hens inside a battery cage, they still have that same instinct going on to establish dominance. But the tragic thing is that inside a battery cage there is no room for the less dominant bird to back off. And so instinctively, because these hens are incredibly frustrated and because the, the less dominant bird is not able to back off, often the pecking persists to the point that blood is drawn. And once blood is drawn, especially in confined cages like this, you can get continued pecking and fatalities. Now, obviously, the chicken industry could not survive the widespread fatalities that would occur if the chickens were permitted to peck each other as they normally would under such crowded conditions. So really the way to deal with this is to make sure that the heck get enough room so that they won't peck each other. But the egg industry has found a different way to deal with that and what they do is, is what I call beak searing. And in beak searing what they do is they take a hot blade on a newborn chick and cut off the end of the chick's beak. And by blunting the end of the beak like this, it makes the beak unable to draw blood, 
when they peck at each other. So rather than solve the problem of too many birds in a cage by giving sufficient space and dealing with the welfare problems, they actually amputate part of the hen's beak. Maybe that doesn't sound so bad, actually, when you first hear it, because, you know, a, a beak is sort of this plasticky wooden thing and dead as a fingernail, clearly, when you look at it, except inside of the beak is the chicken's mouth, and it extends the length of the beak. So when you sear the bird's beak and, and the last part of it, you're actually cutting out part of the hen's mouth. The point I want to make about this is I'm not talking here about some terrible chicken farm somewhere that's unique. I'm talking about every chicken farm. But I still haven't talked about what I think is the most objectionable part of the chicken industry. And it's actually not the confinement. It's the manner in which these birds are caged. The cages have wire on the sides, on the top, and even on the bottom. If you can look past the suffering that this wire produces, which I'll discuss in a minute, it's actually pretty ingenious what they have, how they've structured this industry. You see, they want to spend as little time as humanly possible with the hens cleaning their cages and treating them or, or doing anything for them. The less time needed for human care to occur, the more profitable the industry can be. And so it, it works out that really layer hens get essentially no human attention whatsoever. Now, why is that relevant to wire bottomed cages? Well, that's a key part of things because if you make the cages wire bottom and you space the wire far enough that all the feces and urine fall through, but close enough together that it catches the eggs, the eggs can roll out of the cage and onto the conveyor belt and all the feces and urine drops through, and there's never a need to clean the cages or to gather the eggs. It's, it's really an ingenious system if you can look past the horrendous things that happen to the birds when they have to stand on wire and sleep on wire 24 hours a day, every day of their lives, and their lives typically last 18 to 24 months. When you go see a battery cage, when you go to an egg farm and you see how these birds are kept, one of the curious things is that if you happen to go to an egg farm where the hens are only, say, a few months old, they look like they're in pretty good shape. They really do. Uh, they're crowded as can be, but they look re relatively healthy and vigorous and it doesn't look so bad except that they're so crowded. But what happens is as the weeks and months go by, standing on wire and sleeping on wire and pressed against wire cage sides, the wire abrades their feathers and eventually wears their feathers away. And so by the time you see hens that are a year old or a year and a half old, it's like you're not seeing hens at all. You see these birds with huge bare patches of skin, often with sores and abrasions and cuts from being pressed into wire or being pecked at, and even a mutilated and blunted beak can cause wounds. And what you see when you walk into an egg farm where the birds have been kept any length of time is just unimaginable. Now, if you go to veganoutreach.org or if you go to the back of this room, you'll be able to look at their Why Vegan pamphlets and you'll see some of the photos gathered from an egg farm. If you're uninitiated in, in what happens to these hens, the photos you'll see will, I assure you, is unbelievable. Any sensible person looking at these photos will conclude this just has to be an exceptionally harsh farm. It, it can't be like this in all of these farms. And let me tell you, I've been to egg farms, and these photos, the photos you see in the vegan outreach material and that you'll likely see if you go surfing on the web at animal rights sites, the photos that you can see of how hens are kept in these cages do not begin to do justice to the problem. When you actually go to one of these places and you see firsthand 
the state these hens are in. It, it's just a whole nother level. And that's, that's a big part of the reason why I think that the egg industry is even more objectionable than the meat industry. The suffering is just so profound for such tiny amounts of food. Now, now what do I mean so much suffering for so little food? Well, it takes a hen 30 hours in a battery cage to lay just one egg. 30 hours pressed against wire for something that you can buy in a supermarket for about a dime. There's no way that our cost of animal products reflects the pain and suffering that these animals go through. Now, I, I want to say one more thing before I finish with the egg industry. And that is, long ago, decades ago, the meat chicken industry and the egg industry split off. It used to be that farmers raised the same chickens, some they'd, the females they'd keep and they'd lay some eggs, the males and the, some of the females they would slaughter for meat, and they were all from the same birds. Well, decades ago, they split them off into two different varieties. And you've got the meat chickens and you've got the egg chickens now. And the progress that they've made with the meat chickens is just breathtaking. Back in the 50s, in 40s and 50s, it used to take about 20 weeks for a newly hatched bird to mature and reach slaughter weight. Now, birds are sent to slaughter in seven weeks. And not only that, they're much bigger than 20-week-old hens from the 1950s. It's remarkable. And they have much more breast meat uh, the progress the meat chicken industry has made with concocting ever more efficient, fast-growing breeds is truly impressive in a really horrifying way when you see how these birds are raised and what their lives end up being like. But I'm telling you about this, this divide between egg chickens and meat chickens for a reason. The reason is that Obviously, with, with meat chicks growing as quick as they do, there's no way that the egg chicks can ever begin to compete in terms of growth. Now, this leads to a really horrible aspect of the egg industry, and that is that the egg industry is continually breeding chickens for their, for their egg farms. And the chickens they're breeding are, of course, egg-laying egg chickens. They're the layers. Now, the trouble is that half of the chickens that hatch are going to be males. And they will be males of the layer variety. And even though they have all the right genes for laying tons and tons of eggs, they're obviously not going to lay a single egg. But they won't grow quickly enough to be worth raising for meat. The egg industry couldn't give these birds away to the meat industry because you'd, you'd lose money if you tried to raise them. They grow so slowly in comparison to chickens bred just for meat. So that means, of course, that these, these layer chicks that are unfortunate enough to be born as males have no use, no purpose whatsoever. And it is illustrative of how animal agriculture operates and how the egg industry in particular sees these animals. It's illustrative of, of that by, by understanding how these male layer chicks are treated. As soon as they peck their way out of the shell, they are sorted by sex and the females are sent to the egg farms, and the males are gotten rid of. And they are not gotten rid of gently. The name of the game is with this industry is that these male chicks are worthless to the industry, and they do not get rid of these unwanted male chicks in ways that take time or money. They get rid of them as quickly as possible. Much to the industry's shame, they do not actually, to my knowledge, keep any kind of records as far as different slaughter methods for these newborn male chicks. But from what I am able to determine, 
the most common way of getting rid of these male chicks is by simply throwing them into a dumpster or a trash can or a plastic bag and having them smother under the weight of ever more unwanted male layer chicks. Now there's another way they sometimes get rid of them and perhaps this is more humane, perhaps not. I know that some of these hatcheries buy the same kind of under the sink grinder trash disposer that you might have at your home. And in fact, restaurants can get these under the sink and sinkerator type devices only in a much bigger size. And some of these hatcheries order the large ones and they grind up the chickens while still alive. They just drop them in and they keep this device going and they're continually dropping male newborn chicks into these under the sink trash disposals and that's how they get rid of them. I understand that some of these chicks are gassed and I, I further understand, although I have not confirmed, I believe some of these chicks are gassed with carbon dioxide which would be immensely painful. I'm telling you this to give you a sense of how animal agriculture operates and the fact that it, I have only so far really talked about the egg industry. But as you've seen, this is an industry that is thoroughly on commodity-based foods. Their job is to produce foods at the lowest possible cost. And only the low-cost producers survive. So they have every incentive to continually be cutting their costs. Now, if what this means is really telling, it's quite telling. It's that if you are wanting to be in the business of factory farming and you care even a little more about the animals than your competitors, you're not going to be able to afford to give these animals extra space or somewhat better conditions if that costs you extra time and money. Because these are commodity-based foods, unless you are the low-cost producer, you're going to go out of business. Now, there are, of course, free-range egg farms. There are, of course, organic dairies. But those are always problematic ethically. All conditions can be substantially better than at conventional egg farms. But think about what free-range means. It means that the animals get some access to the outdoors, but it's nothing about stocking densities and confinement. It says nothing about beak searing. It says nothing about what these birds are fed. And m more to the point, it says absolutely nothing about slaughter. And one thing you can count on is that any package of free-range eggs you've ever seen sold in a market comes from birds that are going to the slaughterhouse. It's every bit as guaranteed as with conventional agriculture. Merely housing the birds in perhaps better conditions does not change the fact that economically you're better off at about 18 months or two years getting rid of these birds and bringing in fresh hens to lay because they'll lay in higher quantities. Same thing with, it's the same thing with the dairy industry and organic milk. Just because you're feeding the cows a little bit better does not change the dynamic that animals are going to be sent to water. Now, I've, I've had only the bare minimum amount of time that I need to touch on the ethical aspects of animal agriculture. But together, I think several points are true and just indisputably true. First of all, this is an industry that time and again has shown that it is resistant to having any accountability for animal agriculture. This is an industry that is more than happy to put hens into tiny, tiny cages with wire bottoms, no matter what kind of ordeal that may entail for them. This is an in industry that castrates steers and castrates pigs without anesthetic more than 99% of the time. 
This is an industry that dehorns without anesthetic and brands without anesthetic. And this is an industry that slaughter practices are just not just repulsive, they are inhumane in the worst sense of the word. Every time I have gone to a factory farm, I have seen animals in the most appalling conditions and in the most dire of need. And you want to be able to rescue them all. But really, rescuing individual animals does not get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is in what each of us consume. If I've shared nothing with you tonight regarding animal agriculture, uh, other than this one point, I just want to say that dairy products and eggs are every bit as objectionable as meats in terms of the total cruelty involved. Now, I told you at the beginning of this talk that I made a switch to a vegetarian diet when I was 19, and I got a couple of cookbooks that were full of dairy products and eggs. And after I started learning about the fate of dairy cows and about the fate of layer hens, I realized that I didn't have a choice, that if I really wanted to divorce myself from the slaughterhouse, which was my whole goal from the beginning, I had to go beyond being vegetarian. I had to become one of those vegans. In hindsight, I realized that I, I want to share one piece of advice with you because I, I want to say that going from non-vegetarian to vegetarian and thinking in terms of making the switch and stopping at vegetarian, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of the suffering of the animals and it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of making things as easy on yourself as possible. I, I really think that in a lot of ways the ovo-lacto vegetarian concept is fundamentally flawed. That it's just a lot more useful to think of being vegan or being nearly vegan or being mostly vegan than it is to use ovo-lacto vegetarianism as a base or a stopping point. Because in the, in the one year that I was an ovo-lacto vegetarian, I really don't think that my diet did anything to reduce animal suffering compared to the meat-based diet that I was following before. And one of the things that I regret is that I went out and purchased these cookbooks that were full of dairy and egg recipes, and they were delicious recipes. And I took a lot of time learning these recipes, but once I figured out the the cost in terms of suffering of, of dairy products and eggs, I knew I had to learn new recipes and I had to get rid of my vegetarian cookbooks and replace them with vegan cookbooks. And so one of the things I want to tell you if you're not vegan yet, even if you don't think you could ever be vegan, I, I still want to say don't buy vegetarian cookbooks. I, I think that uh, I, in some ways I, I consider myself to be um, a, a huge anti-vegetarian activist in, in, in that I want to say, if you're in the market for a cookbook, make it a vegan cookbook. Now, 10 or 15 years ago, there weren't that many vegan cookbooks available, and, and really, the ones that did exist all had one thing in common. They sucked. Uh, I mean, they, they all were printed on 8.5 by 11 paper, and they had this cover that looked like it was produced in your cousin's garage or something. They were all second-rate looking, and, and often the recipes were second-rate as well. But over the last 10 or 15 years, there has been a huge change in the quantity and quality of vegan cookbooks, and now they stand shoulder to shoulder in terms of production values and dedication to quality recipes with any non-vegetarian or ovo-lacto vegetarian cookbook. I don't have any cookbooks with me today, but I want to share with you a couple of good ones. I think the best starting point is a book by Robin Robertson called Vegan Planet. And now, what's wonderful about this book is you can buy it, you can go to vegan.com and click on our Amazon link, and when you buy the book, it's only about $15 for the paperback, and this thing is about as thick as the Manhattan Yellow Pages. And 
it's only $15, and every recipe turns out. Uh, she's just a really great cook, and I, I recommend this cookbook just as highly as I possibly can. Another fantastic book is, uh, is brand new. It's called Viva La Vegan, and it's a family-oriented cookbook for cooking for three, four, or five people, cooking for a family. And great typography, very simple, basic, but delicious recipes that anybody can make usually in half an hour to 45 minutes. So Viva La Vegan by Drina Burden is a terrific recipe book as well. I want to say that if you are making the switch to becoming vegetarian or vegan, don't worry about it. It's, it's not something you have to do tonight or tomorrow or next week. Give yourself some time and take it easy on yourself. And believe it or not, you'll get there. There's really two steps to becoming a vegan, to go from being a meat eater to being a vegan. First step is being like, oh, I can't imagine all the things I'm going to have to give up. This is going to be so hard. This is going to be so hard. The next step is a few months have gone by and you realize that you're essentially vegan and you look back and you can't believe how easy it was. Now, let me tell you the basic things that you can keep in mind to make your transition as easy as possible. The, the first thing to keep in mind, make a commitment to put 10, 15 minutes a day into learning to be vegan. That's about all it takes. Being vegan is a learned skill, just like playing tennis or riding a skateboard. And it's not one of the harder things that you're going to learn in your life. It's actually, believe it or not, an enjoyable process. You're always discovering new foods. So for 10 or 15 minutes a day, every day, just make a point of doing something like browsing through a vegan cookbook for recipes or going to, say, down to earth market and shopping for some foods. Just walk up and down the aisles and see what new things you've never tried before catch your eye. Or spend 15 minutes a day preparing some quick new sandwich. Or, or The point is that day after day, put in a little bit of time to finding something new. You see, the, the vegetarians and vegans who I meet who end up being dissatisfied with their diet, I find they usually have one thing in common. They are geared towards cutting out the meat or cutting out the dairy or cutting out the eggs instead of adding new things and adding new things and crowding out those things. So, so crowd out, don't cut out, because every time you find a new food, it will push away all the foods that you've grown up eating. And it's, it's a reasonably quick process, and it's just delicious. And make a point of trying something new every day. Half the time you may not like it, but I'd say at least half the time it'll be tolerable. And even if one in ten times you found something that you think is wonderful, that means you're a big step closer. It doesn't take too many wonderful new discoveries before you have a pretty diverse set of foods that you can be eating. And it's just a great, um, it's, a, it's a great experience and a fun experience. Finally, you can listen to my show. I have a show on vegan.com, and I have great recipes. Trina Burden is currently doing a cooking segment. She's about to get started with that in each of my shows. And it's a 20-minute show that will acquaint you with the latest animal protection happenings, the latest vegetarian happenings, and so forth. And it's very simple and straightforward. And if you have an Internet connection, just go to vegan.com and give the show a listen. Now, I don't have very much time left, and I want to talk very briefly about the animal protection movement, because as, as I think I've demonstrated, the suffering that goes on in animal agriculture is just appalling and widespread. We kill more than 10 billion farmed animals a year in the United States. I've been working full-time in animal protection for about 10 years now, over 10 years. And my first book came out about seven years ago. And it was called Vegan, the New Ethics of Eating. And I hoped that it would really make a dent in animal agriculture. Well, 
In the years that followed the book's publication, I kept an eye on how things were going in the movement and how things were going for farmed animals. And I had to wonder, are we making progress or are we losing ground? And looking at things, from some respects, it looks pretty good. We've seen the number of vegan cookbooks go through the roof. We see the natural food industry growing at 20% a year. We see the word vegan being used in newspapers and on talk shows, and nobody has to define what it is anymore. People tend to know it. So in a lot of ways, we've gained a lot of ground. But then you look at what I think really matters. How many animals are we killing? And when my book came out seven years ago, we were killing seven billion farmed animals a year. Now we're up to more than 10. A big part of this is that we're eating more chicken than ever, and chicken are tiny animals, and so it, you have to kill a whole lot of them to get a relatively small amount of meat. So as we shift from pigs and cattle to eating chickens, the number of animals slaughtered has gone through the roof. But beyond that, Believe it or not, last year, Americans are eating more meat than ever. In fact, last year we set a record in the United States for pounds of meat eaten per person. So with all these things in mind, I have to conclude that as an activist, as somebody who cares passionately about animal protection, our movement is losing ground. Now, I don't have time to get into the reasons for that, but I think there's a couple main reasons that I at least want to touch on. The first reason, I think, is that our choice of rhetoric, how we construct our arguments, is often not all that it could be. For the last 20 or 30 years, the vegetarian movement has usually used a three-pronged attack in terms of our rhetoric. We've talked about health, we've talked about the environment, we've talked about the ethics of eating farmed animals. And there are great health reasons, great environmental reasons, great ethical reasons to consider this diet. But in writing this book, I began to ask, well, maybe the reason our movement is not gaining the kind of traction and progress it might is because our arguments are perhaps not as persuasive or credible as they need to be. So one of the things that I did in writing Meat Market was I decided to essentially take a blowtorch to all of the standard vegan arguments, all of our rhetoric, just take a blowtorch to it and see what remained standing when I was done. What arguments are so robust and credible that even the most serious skepticism can't deflate these arguments. And what I found is that while there are some very good health arguments and some very good environmental arguments supporting plant-centered eating, there, these arguments also are sometimes pushed too far by our movement. In fact, they're often pushed too far. And there are gaps in how we argue things that I think when we make these arguments, we sometimes lose credibility by unwittingly pushing things too far. So uh, I, I, I should perhaps talk uh, very briefly about how I think that's the case. I don't think that, that the vegetarian movement ever got together and colluded and said, you know, we got to further that should go. We got to push the environmental argument further that should go. I think this happened as a result of just some good faith thinking. When you compare the profile of vegetarian foods to animal foods, it's just a night and day difference. Animal foods are full of fat, full of saturated fat, full of bacteria, and when you try to cook away this bacteria and make it safe, you get heterocyclic amines. So just everywhere you look, it's bad news. And then you bring out the vegan foods, and it's like angels start singing. You've got foods that are full of fiber, tend to be low in fat. What fat there is tends to be unsaturated, has no cholesterol at all. And it's just a night and day difference, and it only stands to reason that a vegan diet really should be the only way to go. You'd have to be mad to be eating animal-based foods when you could be eating a mouthful of healthier vegan foods. Now, I think that you can absolutely construct a vegan diet that 
that no other diet can exceed in terms of longevity and health. But what we have to understand is that if we're going to be basing one-third of our argument on health, we really have to be seeing some big-time differences in longevity and mortality rates when comparing vegans to non-vegetarians. And we're just not seeing this. And, and I think it costs us credibility when we try to make these arguments. Because after all, everybody has some aunt or grandmother who's 94 and has smoked all her life and eaten meat three times a day. So the point I'm trying to make here is that a well-planned vegan diet, no doubt about it, it's as healthy a thing as you can eat. But it just doesn't deserve to be one-third of our focus, our, of our argument. Now, I'm not saying never make the health argument. I'm not saying that at all. There are certainly times that the health argument can be made very successfully to certain people. And what my book does in Meat Market, I talk about the strengths of the health argument. I also talk about where its limitations are so that we don't unwittingly push, push the arguments too far. I don't have time to get into the environmental argument, but I want to say that the same thing is true there. A lot of the environmental stuff that we claim and that sort of become gospel within the vegetarian movement has unwittingly been pushed too far. I know that, I know that there are so many people here who care passionately about these issues, and I hope we can work together. I hope that you will visit vegan.com and be in touch with me if there's any way that, we, that I can help you or we can work together. And I hope that you will consider doing your part to volunteer for this superb first-rate organization. So thank you so much for listening to me tonight. Thank you, Eric, very much. This certainly has pointed out how important all three of our pillars are. And it's wonderful that there are people who stress one over the other so that all of them will be given the due that they are, they are due, whether health, human health, the environment, or animal rights. You know, we, fortunately for us, vegetarianism or veganism will solve all three of these pressing issues and problems. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344, or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.